please give a very warm welcome to Gary Wood. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank Richard, but also to thank you for um, voting for me to be here. Um, I was amazed when I um, was even nominated to be involved in this series, um, and even more so that then I became one of the final six. Um, so thank you for that, and I hope that over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, um, I can share with you some of the secrets about one of the most amazing things that you've ever done in your life. And of course, what I'm talking about there is learning to speak your first language. If you think about this, actually it probably doesn't seem like it's that amazing as a thing for you to have done, because you don't really remember much about it, it happened very quickly, and you didn't really have to put all that much effort into making it happen. What's surprising though, if you start to think about this, is that you didn't have to put all that much effort into it, and yet you learnt it very quickly. So by the time you were four or five, you knew pretty much everything you need to know about language. There were some things that you had to acquire later, and things like words, you'll continue to learn throughout your life and add to the words that you already know. But the majority of the constructions that you needed, the majority of the underlying rules that you needed, were there and you had them by the time you were five. And except in very rare cases, children do this without having to really think about it. Even if they're deaf or they're blind, they can still learn to, to speak and to use language communicatively. Compare language, then, with tying your shoelaces or with adding together two numbers. Those two tasks seem to be comparatively simple. If you think about what you have to do now to tie your shoes, dead easy. Add together two numbers, it's dead easy. And yet, by the time you were five, you were able to use language like an adult, apart from needing to learn some more words, and at the same time, you couldn't tie your shoes yet, and you had to spend a long time and get very frustrated learning to add together two numbers. So this really is an amazing thing that you did. And I want to explore with you tonight um, how you went about doing that and how we can account for this process um, in thinking about language acquisition. So what we'll do is think a little bit about what linguistic knowledge is like. What kind of knowledge is it that you have to have? And that will allow us to think about some of the problems in gaining this knowledge in the first place. What are the issues and why is this um, a difficult problem for you to face? We'll look at some developmental data. We'll look at some of the, of the data that we've got about what children know. Of course, in the course of 30 minutes, I'm not going to be able to share very much with you. But what I want to do is to focus on a few examples that will lead to three different surprises, three surprising things that you'll find out that you probably didn't realize already about language. And then we'll use that to think about how the process of language acquisition works and about um, where your language came from in the first place. So. Um, those of you who are my students will know that I like to have interaction in my lectures. I don't like to stand here and talk at you. So I'm going to invite you to just take a minute to talk to the person next to you and think about this question. Before you do that, what I missed on my first slide is to tell you that I have a hashtag for this presentation. And I'd like you to use that hashtag during the course of what I'm about to say um, to send me your thoughts. Tell me what you think, what impresses you, what amazes you. And if you've got questions, then post those to that hashtag too, and we can pick some of those up at the end. And that hashtag is ICO for Inspiration and Co, followed by LA for Language Acquisition. So ICOLA, dead easy to remember. So take two minutes, talk to the person next to you, and think about who taught you language. And then I'm going to ask you to shout some answers out at me. OK, so then, just not quite two minutes, but what ideas have you come up with? Who taught you language? Put your hand up if, in the last minute or so, what you've said to the person next to you is your parents. And as if by magic, I knew that that's what you were going to say. <laughs> and I knew that because everybody says that. When you ask them who taught you language, everybody says it was their parents. I was doing an open day talk on Saturday, and I asked this question, and everybody gave me the same answer. What I want to do first, then, is to convince you that this isn't the case. One problem with thinking that parents teach you language is that parents actually focus on the content of what their children say. And they don't really seem to care so much about the form of what children say. In other words, they obsess with the truth, they want their children to be telling the truth, but they're not so worried about the grammatical constructions that they use to get there. 
And to see that, consider this example. I'm not going to read it to you, you can read it for yourself, but notice this word that's highlighted in yellow. This is not the way that you would express the idea of having used the piece of paper. You would not say, I write it on it. And, but if you look at what the adult does here, he just carries on. He doesn't take any notice of the fact that the child is making this grammatical error. The child is telling the truth, he has written on the piece of paper, and so the conversation continues and the adult doesn't pick up on this. Adults also focus on the appropriateness of what their children say. So you'll hear parents all the time telling their children not to let them hear them say particular things again when they've been rude or when they've sworn at somebody. So you might sit there and think, well, actually, sometimes corrections are offered to children. Sometimes adults do try and tell children what they should say. Well, that's true, but they're very sparse. We don't get that many corrections being offered to children. And worse, when they are offered, actually the children don't take any notice. They don't care about the fact that somebody's telling them to change the way that they speak. And here is the classic example that illustrates this. So the child says, one other one spoon, daddy. You mean you want the other spoon? Yes, I want other one spoon, please, daddy. Can you say the other spoon? Other one spoon. So he tries a different approach. Say other, other spoon. Spoon. Other spoon. Other spoon. Now give me other one spoon. <laughs> and the, the, although this is the classic example, there's lots of examples like this. Children really don't care um, when adults try and correct their language. They just carry on regardless. So there are lots of problems with this idea that parents teach their children to speak. But perhaps a bigger problem is this question of who trains them to teach you. How do they know what to teach you? Here's surprise number one. Let's consider some linguistic data and think about what you know about it. Take this question, who did you think Sean hit? Is this a good question? Can I say this and does it sound grammatical? Just nod or shake your head. Who did you think Sean hit? So there's a situation where I think that Sean hit somebody but I don't know who that person is. And I want to ask you this question, who did you think Sean hit? People nodding their head at me. This seems fine if I give you the context to put it in. How about this one? Who did you think that Sean hit? Yeah, some people still nodding at me. Some people a bit less sure, but lots of people still nodding at me. So there might be a preference to have number one here, but people still accept number two as being reasonably good as well. Number three, who did you think hit Bill? Yeah? Seen some people nodding at me. How about number four? Who did you think that hit Bill? Everybody not shaking their head straight away. So some of them you had to think about. Some of them it took you a few minutes to work out whether or not you think it's grammatical. But number four, you're sure, is bad. Everybody shaking their head at me. Why? What's wrong with number four? Actually, I'd be amazed if anybody had put their hand up at this point and tried to explain to me what's wrong with number four here. And yet, notice something interesting. You all knew that something is wrong with number four. <clears throat> Compare number one and two, and you'll see that the only difference between them is this extra word I've inserted, that, in the second case. Compare three and four, you'll notice that the difference is just this word, that, that I've inserted as well. But there's some problem with the fourth case that you all know about, but you can't tell me what the problem is. You all know that you wouldn't use this construction, but you don't really know why. And that's because the knowledge that you have about your language is tacit. It's not something that's available explicitly to your consciousness. You have to spend time studying these kinds of things as a linguist if you want to understand what's going on here. And yet, at some level, you know what's going on and you would never produce a sentence like number four. So surprise number one is that you know things that you didn't know you knew about language <clears throat> because the knowledge is tacit. And we'll think about what these surprises mean um, in a few minutes. So some people say, when you ask them this question, who taught you language, that they taught themselves. And there are two approaches that try to explain that this might be possible. The first of these is the nature or nativist approach that suggests that maybe there's an innate basis to language development. 
maybe you're born with some level of knowledge about language that equips you to be able to learn the language successfully and to be behaving like an adult speaker by the time you're five. And so on that approach, we talk about languages being acquired rather than learnt to distinguish the fact that they're not learnt in the same way as you learn maths or that you learn to tie your shoes. It's not an effortful process. It's a very different type of process because it's guided by some innate knowledge that is just there when you're born. And the opposite approach to that is to say that actually you're not born with any specifically linguistic knowledge. You have knowledge about how to find patterns. Um, you have knowledge um, that's domain general, that's to say not specific to language. And you put that, not that, um, those cognitive abilities to use in working out the patterns of language for yourself and learning the language in the true sense of learning, figuring things out, trial and error, until you eventually arrive at the adult target. And these are the two broad approaches to thinking about language acquisition. Either we claim that there's some innate basis, or we claim that you learnt it using these domain general cognitive abilities. Just put your hand up if you feel more inclined to believe at this point, but on the basis of the little amount of information I've given you, that you have some innate knowledge of language. OK, put your hands down, and then put your hand up if you think that actually you probably learnt language. OK, so a fairly even split. We'll try that again towards the end, and we'll see if I've managed to convince you to switch from one view to the other. So let's take for a minute the idea that you're going to teach yourself language based on various kinds of input that you have or based on the kind of innate knowledge that you're born with. There are some problems with this approach. There are some problems that you'll face as a child trying to teach yourself language. The first problem that you'll face is that language is creative and infinite. We can create a sentence and we can keep making that sentence bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually you'll get to a point where you can't cope with it being any longer because you just can't remember it. But that's not a limitation of the language. It's a limitation of your memory. So I can say, it rained. And then I can say, John said it rained. And Mary thinks John said it rained. And I can keep going. I can make the sentence longer and longer. That means that you can't possibly hear every possible sentence of your language in the course of acquiring the language. But you need to be able to cope with hearing every possible sentence that somebody might produce. And you need to be able to produce every grammatical sentence of the language yourself. So the problem you face here is that you can't just simply copy what other people around you produce. You need to get to some level of underlying representation. You need to figure out what the underlying rules are and then be able to use those rules for yourself to form and understand sentences that you've never heard before. And the second problem, there's lots of problems, but the second problem that we're going to focus on for tonight is the so-called no negative evidence problem. And what I mean by this is that the input that you hear around you as a child consists almost exclusively of grammatical sentences. By the time you're an adult-like speaker, you need to be able to recognize what's a good sentence and what's a bad sentence. In other words, you need to know what the, the boundaries are in the grammar. You need to know how to construct a good sentence and how to avoid constructing bad sentences. You need to know what not to do. But the input that you have is just examples of good sentences. And nobody ever tells you what you can't do. Nobody specifically says to you, you can't insert that in sentences like number four that I just showed you. Somehow you have to get to have that knowledge, but nobody's going to tell you that that's the way it works. So you've got to work backwards. You've got to listen to adults speaking around you, using language grammatically, and work backwards from there to get to a point where you can have knowledge of what's not possible. So with that much in place, let's think about some of the things that children have to learn, some of the things that children need to come to know. And this is going to be just a few examples so that we can then start to address um, the issue of where language might come from. And the point of this is really summarized quite nicely, I think, by this quote from Crane and Petrosky, who say that the question of whether children learn language cannot be intelligently asked, much less answered, until one has a sense of what children learn. We have to know what the challenge is. What is it that we're trying to do 
before we can think about the nature of the process that gives rise to that. So the first steps into language, then, involve learning the sounds. And as a child, you'll be surrounded by the sounds of language from the moment that you're born, and maybe even before that. And some of these sounds are rather strange, because adults have this weird way of talking to children. They say things like what you see here on the side. I'm not going to read this as if I was talking to a child, but you can imagine how this would sound. Oh, you are gorgeous. You are gorgeous. You are. You are. You are. Oh, yes, you are. Hello. Hello. Aren't you beautiful? Imagine what would happen if I went to a meeting with the vice chancellor and spoke like this. I don't think I would be here for very much longer. And yet, almost universally, we do this. We talk to children in this strange way. And you might wonder if there's any point. Why would we bother to talk to children when they're just a few days or even hours old and they can't possibly respond to us? Well, actually, there's lots of evidence that it's important to talk to children at that point because although they can't produce language, they're sensitive to the input that you're giving to them. And very early, they can distinguish the sounds of language from all the other sounds in the world around them. So they don't get confused between somebody who's speaking and the sound of a helicopter or a telephone or a cow or a washing machine. In fact, one really impressive finding about what children are able to do at this early stage is that within two days of being born, it's been shown frequently several times in different studies that children can distinguish one language from another within that first two days of being born. How do we know that? Well, we use apparatus that look a little bit like this, although more modern today. We use computers instead of all these knobs and dials that you see here. And the way that this process works is that you'll see in this image that the child is sucking a dummy. And that dummy is fitted with a, a pressure sensor. So we can measure the intensity of the sucking of the child. So we start off by just measuring their baseline sucking rate. We know how intense the child is just sucking, lying there in this cot. And then we play them a sample of some particular language. And what happens is that the children are quite interested in this. It, it, it entertains them that something new is happening. There's these new sounds that they're being exposed to. And that's reflected in the fact that the intensity of their sucking suddenly increases when we start to play these speech sounds to them. And if we keep those speech sounds playing for a while, then gradually the intensity of their sucking decreases again because they get fed up with it. It's not new anymore. Um, there's, there's nothing really that interesting about it. And so they just go back to the baseline sucking level. That gives us a way to check whether children can distinguish one language from another. Because if, after the child have dro child's dropped back to their baseline sucking level, we change the language that we're playing to them, so there's no gap, it just suddenly changes into a different language, if the child notices that difference, then they'll be interested again, because this is something new that they're now hearing. And their sucking rate increases again to the level that we saw when they were interested in the first language that we played in the beginning. If they don't notice the difference, then we wouldn't expect there to be any increase in the sucking level. They're just hearing noise. And by using this approach, we can see that children do distinguish um, two languages even within the first few hours of having been born. So that gives us some evidence that children are sensitive to speech sounds, sensitive to language from a very early point. And so maybe there is a point in talking to children, even in that strange kind of way, at this very early point in their development and way before they'll actually start to produce any response to this. By the time the child gets towards their first birthday, they'll be producing the first sounds that we can recognize as linguistic, that they'll be producing their first words. And it might be tempting to think that that's the first point at which they start producing language. But actually, a lot of development in terms of the production of sounds has already gone on by that point. So the earliest productions that we get from children are things like papa and mama and baba and dada. These repetitive sounds where you get a syllable that's just repeated over and over again. And what's interesting about this 
is that initially children produce this kind of babbling, this kind of repetitive sound, not just using sounds from the native language that they've been exposed to, but sounds from a whole range of languages across the world. And then towards their first birthday, as they start to get towards producing their first words, we get this drift in the sounds that they're producing, and they start to sound more native-like. They start to be babbling the sounds of their first language. And the other sounds from other languages that they've been using start to disappear. Parents get very excited at this stage. They hear the child saying something like, Mama, and go and tell everybody that their child's called them mummy. Actually, the bad news for the parents is that the child's not doing that at all. The point of this is that they're learning to use the, the articulators, their vocal tract, the moving stream of air that they've got coming out of their mouth, and their teeth and their tongue to shape that in order to be able to produce the sounds of language. And in this early stage of from about six months through to their first year, it's just about learning to have control of those articulators, to be able to produce speech sounds accurately. The child is not trying to say mummy here when they say mama, and we know that because at this stage they don't realise that sounds can be labels for things, that words can have meanings and refer to things in the world. One other piece of evidence that the child is not trying to name somebody here, they're not trying to call them uh, mummy, is that this kind of babbling happens most often when the children are by themselves. And clearly, that indicates that this can't be about communication. Why would you bother to do this by yourself if what you were trying to do is to communicate with somebody? So, just so that you can get a sense of what this is like, I'm going to play you a video of this child doing this kind of babbling. And then we'll have a look after this at the next stage in their development before they start producing their first words. <laughs> Okay, so you get this repetitive sound. It's just the same sound over and over again. And then what starts to happen is that the child starts to pick up on the patterns of sound in their language and starts to produce things that sound more like language but that aren't yet using adult words. They're just strings of sounds, but that have the kind of stress patterns and rhythmic patterns that actual adult language would have. And here's a child doing exactly that. So you'll see here um, that it sounds like language, even though you've no idea what the child's trying to say, because these, this child is not using words that you recognise. <laughs> What were you talking about? Tell me. Yeah. Really? Uh-huh. Oh my goodness, I didn't even know that. Are you serious? Really? That really happened. <laughs> Just yesterday? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, so you see there that there's a much broader range of sounds. The child is using a, 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 a broader range of um, vocal apparatus to be able to produce these sounds, and the, they've picked up on the patterns of their language in terms of its rhythmic properties. So it sounds more like language. And then the next step is going to be for them to produce their first word. Once they start producing their first words, then we start to have the first evidence of their creativity. They start to use language in a creative way. And we can tell that because they produce constructions that they haven't heard adults producing. So we get novel expressions, like when the child's shoe falls off, and they express that by saying, bye-bye shoe. And we also see evidence of them learning some rules of the underlying language, because they apply them too broadly initially. So they produce things like felt instead of fallen. 
or this particularly interesting example, am I have? Any ideas what the child's asking here? Am I have? Am I behaving? Yeah, so what they're doing here is something really quite interesting. Children hear adults around them saying things all the time, like be quiet, be good, be any number of other things, and behave. And what this child has done is to misanalyze that behave as be plus some other bit, have. And so to them, it's logical to ask, am I have? When what they mean is, am I behaving? So these kind of errors that children make are errors in the sense that they're not speaking like adults would speak, but they're revealing in terms of what's going on in the child's mind as they're learning the language, how they're trying to analyze the patterns of the language and to segment it down into what um, seem to be meaningful units like be and have. And we have evidence then that the child is starting to think about the syntax, the, the, the sentence structure of their language, and the morphology, the structure of the words in their language. And we can see that they know some surprising things. And I'm just going to show you two examples of things that it's really surprising that children know at this young stage. The first comes back to this set of sentences with the word that in them. I'm going to take you quickly through what the problem is here from a linguistic point of view, how a linguist would analyse the problem with this. You might find that you get lost along the way. And if that's the case, then don't worry. I don't expect that you're going to know this necessarily by the end. If you do, great, but if you don't, that's fine. What I want you to be impressed by is the fact that every two-year-old child that's been tested with this set of sentences knows the rules I'm about to tell you. Linguistically, we refer to this problem as the that trace effect. And the that trace effect tells us that a question word, so a word that begins with WH usually, like what or who or why, can't be moved from a position that's immediately after a complementizer. And by a complementizer, I just mean a word like that. So we can't move a question word from after the word that when it's immediately after the word that. Let's see how this works. Sean hit Bill. Sean is the subject of this sentence. Bill is the object of the sentence. I can take this sentence, Sean hit Bill, and using the fact that language is creative, language has this property of being recursive, we can embed this sentence inside a longer sentence and say, you think Sean hit Bill. Suppose, then, that I don't know the identity of Bill. So I need to ask a question. I need to find out the identity of the person that Sean hit. So I've got these question marks here because that indicates the thing that I want to find out about. I can ask a question about this, and I can say something like, who do you think Sean hit? You see this strange T that's appeared down here with object written next to it. Notice that that's the position where Bill would be. If I knew the identity of Bill, as I did up here, then he would be in this position after hit. And when we form this question, the who starts off in that position. It starts off down next to hit. And because there's a rule in English that tells us that question words have to appear at the front, it then moves from that position to the front of the sentence. Here, I can insert that, or I can not have that, and it doesn't make any difference. The sentence is still grammatical because this WH word has not moved from a position that's immediately after the word that. There's other words in between. Compare that with a, a case where I'm questioning the subject of the sentence. So this time, Sean, I know the identity of Bill. I want to know the identity of Sean. Who did you think hit Bill? That's the sentence that you told me is grammatical. And I haven't got this complementizer that before the T, so it's OK for me to move the who from the position where that T is to the front of the sentence. If I try to put that into this sentence, then the sentence will become bad. And it becomes bad because I'm moving this question word from its position immediately after the complementizer to the front of the sentence. If that hurts your head, as I said it might, then don't worry about it, but just be impressed that two-year-old children have some form of that rule because two-year-old children never put uh, or move 
uh, these question words from after complementizers to the front of the sentence. And if you give them ungrammatical sentences and ask them to judge whether they're good or bad, they tell you categorically that they're bad. Another example of things that children know that are surprising. So-called structure dependence. Language is very dependent on structure for the rules that it proposes. And I want to give you an example to see how this works. Take this sentence, the woman is fed up. If I want to turn this into a question, then I can take is and move it to the front of the sentence. Is the woman fed up? If I'm a child encountering this for the first time, and I want to try and think about what the rule might be here for forming a question, then it's logical that I might start with the simplest possible rule that would match this data. So I might claim that what's going on here is that I have to move the third word to the front of the sentence. Is is the third word. I shift it to the front, and then I get a question. But then I might see a case like this. The woman from Sheffield is fed up. And now if I take the third word and move it to the front of the sentence, then I won't get the right result. I won't get a question. From the woman, Sheffield is fed up. Instead, I still have to take this verb is and shift it to the front of the sentence. So maybe the rule is that I have to find is and move is to the front. Oh, now we've got a problem because we've got two verbs is here. Carrie is the only woman who is fed up. If I take this is towards the end of the sentence and shift it to the front, then I get the wrong result. Is Carrie is the only woman who fed up. What I have to do instead is to take the first is. Is Carrie the only woman who is fed up? So maybe the rule is that I have to not just look for is, but check that it's the first is in the sentence before I move it. But then I come across some more data. The woman who is from Sheffield is fed up. And if I move the first is this time, I get the wrong result. I have to move the second is, is the woman who is from Sheffield, is the woman who is from Sheffield fed up? What the rule actually is here is that I have to identify the subject of the sentence, the woman who is from Sheffield, and it's the is or the, the uh, verb that appears after that subject that should get shifted to the front of the sentence. In other words, I have to know something about the structure. I have to know what the subject of the sentence is in order to figure out which verb to move. The rule that I need to learn depends on knowing something about the structure of the sentence. Surprise number two, then, is that this structure dependence is universal. Any language that you go and consider relies on this structure dependent kind of rule. Rules based on the linear order, so say move the third word to the front, are much simpler. It would be much easier if the rule was just not having to identify the subject, but just saying find the third word and shift it to the front of the sentence. But there are no languages in the world that do that. And children never try such simple rules. Now, if they were learning language using normal processes of finding patterns and then forming hypotheses about the language, why would they not do that? Why would they not try out a simple rule before they eventually arrived at the idea that you have to find the subject and then shift the, the verb that appears after the subject to the front? Children never do that. And that's surprising if they're going about this through a process of learning. Final example concerns children producing errors with questions. And you'll see I've put errors in inverted commas here, and we'll discuss why I've done that in a minute. If you look at these four sentences, you think the ball is in the box. If I want to make this into a question, then I can insert the word what instead of the ball. If I don't know what's in the box and I want to find out, I can replace the ball with what. But I wouldn't actually produce you think what is in the box because of that rule in English that says that question words have to appear at the front. What I'd say instead is number three, what do you think's in the box? 
and you see where I've left this line in the position that the ball would have been, in the position that the subject would go. If I leave what in that base position, when I shift it to the front, when I move a copy of it to the front, as in this case here, the result is not grammatical, at least in English. I can't say, what do you think, what's in the box? But that construction, what do you think, what's in the box, is fine in some dialects of German and in many other languages of the world. So in English, you have to shift the word to the front and remove it from the position you, it started in. Some languages, it's OK to leave a copy in the base position and just put a copy at the front of the sentence. What's interesting about this is that English-speaking children, children who are learning to speak English, sometimes produce questions that have this WH word, this question word, in the middle of the sentence as if they were learning German. So they use English words, of course, but what they produce is something that conforms to the grammar of German. What do you think what's in the box? And so that you can see this, here's a video clip of some children um, asking these kinds of questions. What do you think what's in that box? Mm. Ask the bear what he thinks. What do you think what's in this box? Yeah. That was a fun game, wasn't it? How about this one? What do you think who is it? So you see there, this is an English-speaking child. They're using English words, but they're producing questions that for an adult would not be grammatical. At least not an English-speaking adult but would be grammatical for a German-speaking adult. So why would they do that? Why would they produce words or sentences that have German constructions? They're not going to have heard adults saying, what do you think, what's in the box? So they can't be relying just on the input. They can't be copying what adults are doing around them. Further surprise related to this is that there are um, certain positions or certain WH words, certain questions, where we can't repeat the WH word. And this holds across all languages. So no language uses a construction like um, who do you want who to help. And children never do that. So they make the errors in the cases that we've seen them making errors where there are adult languages where that's grammatical. But they never make this kind of error in cases where ad there's not an adult, languages that use th an adult language that uses that word order. Here's an example to show you that. Daddy wants to get your toothpick out of your ears. Oh, I think you could help me. Who do you want to 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 brush to to brush your hair? What do you want to try? Hmm? What do you want to do? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so this brings us to the third and final surprise. Children's language can differ from the local adult language, the target that they're trying to acquire. But it can only do this in limited ways. And those limited ways are exactly the ways in which adult languages can differ from each other. So there are certain differences between English and German. And an English child learning English will sometimes use constructions that we would find in German. But we don't find an English child using a construction that's logically possible, but that we don't find in any language in the world. In other words, there seems to be some um, constraints on this. There seems to be a space in which children explore for possible constructions, but they don't stray outside that space. And that's difficult to explain if we don't assume that children have some kind of innate knowledge, if we don't assume that these parameters are inbuilt, so the child can't stray outside them and can't try and form hypotheses that don't occur in any language in the world. Just to illustrate that, here's a, here's a diagram, because this is quite a tricky point to get your head around, I think. 
So imagine that this yellow circle represents the set of logically possible grammars. So we talked about the idea of structure dependence, and we said that no language uses structure-independent rules, rules that don't rely on the structure. It's logically possible that they could. It's logically possible that the rule could be move the third word to the front, but no languages do that. So this is all the possible rules that we might ever want to propose about language. Real language actually uses a subset of those rules. So structure dependence would be inside this orange circle here. It's a rule that real languages use. Things that still fall in this yellow circle are rules that are not used in any of the world's languages. English uses a subset of the possible rules of all the world's languages, so it falls inside the orange circle. German, there's some overlap between English and German, but then there are some constructions, like having this medial WH word, that we can find in German, but that we don't find in English. So the rules that children are trying out when they're producing something like these medial WH questions fall inside this orange circle. Children never propose rules from the yellow space. There's something that constrains them from doing that and make sure that they'll only try out possibilities in the orange circle. So how can we explain these surprises? Well, I think that this forces us to accept that, or this and other evidence as well that we haven't considered here, but forces us into accepting that maybe there's some innate basis for language. Maybe language is pre-wired. And that the uh, genetic basis for this, the knowledge that you have in learning to speak a language, the knowledge that you have from birth, guides your development. So you're not learning language from a blank slate, but you have something given to you to start with that will guide the process and make sure that it's successful and explain why it seems to be fairly effortless. And for nativists, what we claim is that children don't make errors in that yellow space. They don't try out rules that can't be found in any of the world's language, languages because they have innate knowledge of what's possible in the world's languages to start with. They know what kind of rules they need to be looking for. They know from birth that language is structure dependent. So they don't try out structure independent rules. This pre-wired knowledge is set out as a series of principles. Structure dependence is one, word order is another. And there's a whole series of principles. And what the child has to do then is take these principles as a kind of dot-to-dot -dot pattern, the blueprint for their language, and using the input that they have exposure to, they have to set particular parameters on those principles. And that's how we can account for the fact that languages differ from each other. Let's see an example. Um, English versus Turkish have different word orders. So English has the word order where we have the subject first, then a verb, and then the object. John read the book. Turkish swaps the verb and the object around. So what's pre-wired about this is that children have this principle of word order. They know in advance that word order is important in language. And what they have to do, the learning bit that they have to do, is to take that principle, listen to the input that they're exposed to, and on the basis of that input, set the, the principle to have a parameter for either the object before the verb or the verb before the object. So you can think of these principles as being like a series of switches in the child's mind. The switches are there in advance, but they're in a neutral position. And what the child's task is then reduced to is setting these parameters. So if they are an English-speaking child and they hear sentences where the object is following the verb, they'll set their switch to this top position and the verb will precede the object in every construction that they then produce. If they're a Turkish-speaking child where the object precedes the verb, then they'll set the parameter, they'll set the switch to this bottom position and every sentence that they then produce will have the verb following the object. So to return to my original question then, to wrap up, and where does language come from? 
Well, partly from within. Partly it's given to you at birth. You had this genetic blueprint for what language is like. You knew what, in advance what kind of things you needed to learn about language. But that's not the full story because you have to learn the specific words. You have to tune this genetic blueprint to the specific language that you're being exposed to. And that happens on the basis of experience. You listen to the language around you and you set these switches to determine the grammar of the language that you'll speak. So let's return to the question I asked you earlier. Put your hand up if you're more persuaded by the idea that there's some innate knowledge guiding language development. OK, hands down. Put your hand up if you still think that actually there's nothing innate here that's specific to language, but that you're just good at being able to find patterns and that you can learn these kind of things by yourself. OK, it seems I've converted some of you, but not necessarily all of you. And so at that point, um, I'll stop talking to you um, and invite you to ask me some questions and see if I can convert any more of you. Thank you.